Thank you, Colin, and thank you, everyone, for doing your part and uh, for being uh, steady in the in the works of the Lord and in prayers. We are about to start what I call the continuous online prayer, and uh, it is not. Um, I would say it is not something new that we have done. We have done it, and this is going to be, I think, the third time where we have continuous online prayer perhaps for seven days or so. The first time that we did it was in July 2015 when we were in U.S. And uh, it was continuous nights or all night, plus we even have... Uh, a day session uh, and then we have a rest in the afternoon and then we continue in the evening uh, uh, again with uh, uh, a night session and uh, so it was a uh, tremendous and uh, a lot of things happened the spirit and then uh, the second time that we have uh, continuous prayer was in Singapore and uh, we came back, I believe, for one of the prayer walks. And uh, we decided to have uh, that session of a week of all night prayer in Singapore. And it was broadcasted, and some of you uh, joined online. And uh, now we are having the third session of continuous all-night prayer from the 1st of February to the 8th of February. And uh, you would have uh, a rest tomorrow on Monday where there's nothing on. There's the 31st of January. And then it starts on the Tuesday, the 1st of February, all the way up to the 8th of February, uh, all night, followed by the closing <coughs> evening on the 9th, uh, where we deliver a sermon on, uh, on the prophecies uh, for this year. And as I've been looking into them, there are prophecies that are going to affect this year and the next year. So uh, the Lord strengthen you. And in order to make it slightly easier for all of, all of us so that it does not drag, remember that uh, the all-night prayers uh, would usually uh, just end at around 5.30. And uh, so on the first, the second, and the third, and uh, then the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, they will end at 5.30 with uh, no teaching. Uh, maybe I might just exhort a word or two if the Lord gives a word, and then we will close in prayer so that uh, we do not overstretch each one of you. But on the Friday, which is uh, on the 4th of February, uh, we will do the usual, which is we pray usually up to 5.30, and then Colin will open up for sharing. And then after that, there is a teaching, which will be the last prophetic school teaching. And then we have Q&A. So remember, we do the uh, uh, sharing, teaching, and Q&A only when it is a Friday. All the other uh, continuous online prayer, we just end at 5.30 with an uh, exhortation and a closing prayer. Uh, because otherwise, if we do like Friday, we sometimes like last Friday end about uh, just past 7 a.m. So that dragged on another one and a half hours, which we don't want to do for seven continuous nights. We will only do it on a Friday. And so the last uh, all night on a Friday with Q&A, sharing and teaching, prophetic school is uh, uh, coming up on the 4th of uh, February. Another thing to remind you, uh, because of this continuous uh, all-night prayer that we are concentrating on, next Sunday, there will be no service. So next Sunday is the 6th of February, and uh, we declare a holiday for everyone uh, because the night before, which is the 5th, we'll be praying all night. And uh, 
So when we, uh, uh, when I say end at five thirty is my time, uh, usually in Singapore times about three thirty a.m. My time is five thirty a.m. Uh, Queensland time, and uh, so uh, take note of that. Uh, on all the online prayers, except for Friday, the 4th, uh, we will have teaching, Q&A, and sharing. On all the other night, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th, we will end uh, around 3.30 uh, Singapore time and 5.30 Australia Eastern time. And so next week, I repeat again, there is no Sunday service because uh, we have been praying all night and we want to give everyone a good rest because the evening of the 6th, there is another all night prayer. And so we want to let everyone have a good rest. And after the whole series of all night prayer, which uh, ends on the evening service on the 9th, which is the last night of the 40, 40th day fasting. We also give another holiday on the 11th because uh, then they stand, uh, it ends on a Wednesday and then the 10 is a Thursday, 11 is another Friday again. So the 11th on the Friday, there is no Friday all night. We also declare a holiday for each one of you. And we remind you when that time comes near. But for today, I remind all of you who attend Sundays, but not the all night, that uh, there is no Sunday service on the 6th, because all of us are involved in the prayer the night before and the evening itself. And so I uh, hope that uh, you remember that. Uh, then after, after everything, then we will go back uh, to our regular schedule. It is good that we are running the last lamp with great zeal and having continuous all night prayer is like a series of a week waiting at God's throne and seeking his face. Uh, it's going to be wonderful. The last time we did it in July 2015, USA, it was powerful, wonderful. And then we did it in Singapore for a week of all night prayer. That was also wonderful. And this time we're doing it, especially now that we have crossed the 10th year since uh, this move. And uh, on February the 9th, it is going to be significant. And uh, in all the downloads that we have uh, previously, the year 2022 to 2026 are what we call the super growth of the church. And so it's a year of expansion, a year of signs and wonders. It is also the year that, uh, I have, that I'm preparing myself for, that one of the archangels who have been working in the past with uh, some men of God in the past, uh, at the beginning of the what we call the healing wave in the 1950s uh, is going to make an appearance. And I'm preparing myself for that too, for to receive the uh, endowment of the Lord. And I've been studying a lot uh, on the powers of the Lord and how the Lord uh, manifests his power, how the Lord moves in his power. I have been especially uh, doing more analyses and critical studies uh, to prepare myself in that area. So this is a year of expansion. This is a year of increase. It's a year of increase in the grace of God, in the power of God, in the blessings of prosperity, in the blessings in the spirit, soul, and body avenue for all of us. That is why I call us to prepare in this special year that the Lord has given. Up to today, we have been obedient to all the downloads God gave us. In the year 2020, uh, we were told by the angel to go there to Pergamos and receive uh, the anointing from the Lord. And we did that. 
that was our last prayer walk on uh, February. And uh, it was also an unusual one, which the Lord had won before. See, in all our prayer walks, we always have beautiful weather because the weather angels are working together with us. But on the February 2020 trip, uh, the Lord warned ahead that it's going to be most unusual weather patterns because of what is to come. And it was good that we held it in February because by September of 2020, it was not possible to travel for the whole world began to experience uh, the COVID crisis. And that took all the way to 2021. And here we are in 2022. And uh, there are people predicting that it will reoccur, but no, that's what, not what the Lord has shown. In my news uh, letter, I have mentioned that uh, we're beginning to see a relief on the COVID this year, and many countries will have travel bubble and things will ease, and, uh, and then the travel will be finally, you know, everything will take about two, three years to restore back to the peak of what it was. But this year, uh, there should be possibilities of everyone traveling again. However, I have mentioned in my newsletter, there is a different thing happening this year. It's called the war on money and about high inflation taking place on fiat currency and the turmoil that's going to happen in cryptocurrency until a few of them will emerge uh, as the leading ones, uh, leading ones or some of the others will just disappear. We have won that in our newsletter. There are some more things that is going to take place as this is the 10th anniversary that we are coming into. That's why we want to prepare ourselves for all that the Lord has. I also realize that uh, today is the last Sunday for this series on end time scriptures. And as we look at end time scriptures, we consider uh, different interpretation, different things. Of course, we have not exhausted everything because there's so much more to teach, which we will do at another time. Uh, as we're going to move into a different series uh, after this uh, week uh, of prayer. And so today, I want to focus on the conclusion of these end time scriptures. And that is the most important thing as we all are part of the bride of Christ, knowing that Jesus is going to return in the next 40 years or so. Let us prepare ourselves and live in the perfect will of God. We did a series on uh, the perfect will of God with charts showing, remember, the difference between free will and predestination and how they are at an angle, uh, 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 right angle uh, tension, and how uh, they both work. And uh, God has uh, given me more understanding of what the perfect will and the permissive will is. You will find that uh, the perfect will and permissive will is mentioned in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where we are asked to present our bodies as a living sacrifice uh, so that we may have our minds renewed, that we may know the good, the acceptable, and the word acceptable is sometimes translated permissive, and the perfect will of God. It is important for us to walk in the perfect will of God. But today, I want to point at what the permissive will is so that we don't enter into it, but stay in the perfect will of God. Because the permissive will is not fully understood. And uh, so today, I want to speak about the perfect and the permissive will of God, how to remain in the perfect and not enter the permissive will of God, especially in this end time as we become the bride and the body of Christ. In looking at the permissive will of God, another interesting title that I thought this sermon could be is what I call cutting it 
too close. Cutting it too close is an English expression. That means that, uh, you know, like let's say this is a safety margin and uh, this is a safety margin. And instead of keeping at this safety margin, uh, you purposely uh, go cut very close and uh, much even to the area where it's possible that you endanger yourself. And uh, the permissive wheel is anything from uh, uh, when you start uh, walking outside of God from 1% uh, all the way to 99% uh, before 100% you outside God's will. And uh, so you can be in God's perfect will, it has to be 100%. If you're 1% not in God's perfect will, then you're in the permissive will at least 1%. And so the permissive will is a wide area that uh, we need to understand what it means. And we must, according to this phrase I'm going to use, don't cut too close. Because when you're too close to the danger zone, it is a very dangerous place in the permissive wheel. At the beginning, it still looks okay. But when you keep cutting closer and closer, uh, until there's not much room to maneuver, uh, one mistake can be fatal, and then you enter into a place outside God's will. Let's uh, uh, give some examples in the Bible, uh, and then we explain this concept. Let's look at the book of Numbers and look at the life of Balaam. Balaam is a person in the book of Numbers where he cut too close. And uh, the story here, the background, is that Moses was leading the Israelites through the wilderness into the land of Canaan. And unknown to Moses, of course, it might have been revealed to him by God, but generally no record. Uh, unknown to the Israelites, there were people watching them. And uh, the people are the Moabites, and they are watching who is this group that came out from Egypt. Uh, a, a, a huge group of people who marched like an army through the wilderness. And so... The Moabites, among them was uh, uh, Balak, the son of Zippo, who was the governor over the, all that has done. They saw how uh, Israel had conquered the Amorites and they are very powerful people. So the Moabites are getting worried because Israel was passing through their land. And so Balak sent for this guy that the first time you see him named Balaam. And Balaam seemed to be at first a good man, but he ended up a bad man. And he did many evil things. In fact, in uh, the book of Jesha, he records even more bad things that he did. But um, Balaam at first was a neutral, good guy, and uh, he seemed to have the ability to prophesy. Now, God used people even outside Israel. And through every nation, God has sent his prophets, his teachers, and his Ten Commandments in different way to keep the whole planet in check. And all the laws that come about in various countries that were not exposed to the Israelite Ten Commandments and uh, of Christianity in the New Testament, they have their teachers, they have their philosophers, they have their prophets whom God has raised. They might not be perfect, but at least they bring a certain amount of Ten Commandments to the various countries' structure and laws. So here you have Balaam, who was one of the general prophets who seemed to have a relationship with God and who seems to hear God. 
and seems to be able to discern some things from God. Uh, other people who seem to have some knowledge of God was uh, Moses' uh, father-in-law, Zipporah's father. And he seemed to be also like a priest kind of situation. And so you have uh, this story in chapter 22 of the book of Numbers. And I'll read part of the story in verse 2 on words of Numbers 22. Now, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian and uh, also to the Midianites, so there are two groups of people. Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippo, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Etor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him. Now, the reason he sent for him is he wanted, them, wanted Balaam to curse the people so that they cannot prosper, and then perhaps later they can attack them. And somehow all these people believe in the power of blessing or cursing. And I talked about the power of blessing last Friday. And so uh, I, I mentioned how, how important the power of blessing is. And it was especially prominent in the Old Testament where they have to, where the priests have to bless the people before they go to war. And each time when they rise up to move in the wilderness, uh, Moses and later on Aaron will bless the people again each time they move. In the New Testament, we are all blessed in Christ. Christ has already given us all the blessings. But yet, God also allowed us to, to receive blessings from uh, people. And you see in the, Israel, in the, in the book of Acts that uh, they will lay hands and, and bless and pray for Paul and Barnabas before they go on on a journey, and it was customary for them to bless each other. And some people might say, oh, in Christ, I'm already blessed. I don't need anybody to bless me. Oh, well, don't you understand that there are different levels of growth? And there will always be someone who is an elder over us, and there's always be someone below us who we can help. And uh, so we progress. And did Jesus talk, didn't Jesus bless his disciples? And he practiced that. And uh, then uh, didn't Jesus say that when you receive a prophet as a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward? You receive a righteous man as a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. Isn't it true? that when you hang around people who work with God, the blessing that is on their life comes on you and it makes you easier for you to pray, easier for you to read the Bible, easier for you to see visions, easier for you to grow. Isn't that the blessing when it comes from someone who is senior to you spiritually? In the Bible, there will always be spiritual children, spiritual young men, and spiritual fathers. And the blessing of spiritual fathers help us to grow. Here's another thought. If Jesus had given all of us already all the fullness of blessing, and we don't need anybody on earth, we are like uh, so proud that we can just do everything by ourselves, no need to even attend church, read the Bible all alone, no need any fellowship, just all by yourself. If the blessing of God is automatic, wouldn't it be that every single Christian right now is very powerful and, and, and prosperous and uh, can heal the sick and, and can uh, and cast out devils and, uh, and everything they touch uh, prosper mightily? Uh, shouldn't it be happening automatically? See, that's the thing people don't realize. 
It is not automatic. Even though Jesus has, has done it for us. Look, Jesus has died on the cross for the whole planet. The whole planet right now can be born again. Why is it not born again? Because firstly, sometimes the gospel is not preached properly to them. Secondly, some people have not the knowledge of God or hunger for God to come. And thirdly, some people are too involved with this world. But everyone right now can be saved. They need the gospel to go through them. They need, and even after they are born again, everyone should grow until they can, they can see God because blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Everyone should grow until they are, they are powerfully working along with God in every perfect way. But why is it not automatic? Because it takes growth. And we start as children. Even the Bible, read the Bible. The Bible tells us the moment we are born again, we are babies. Peter says, as babes in Christ, Take the meal of the word. Now, let me tell you, spiritual babies, where are they going to get food? From people who help bring them to born again. For people who are senior to them spiritually, to feed them milk. And Paul says to the Hebrews, he has fed them with milk, but they are not ready for the strong meat of the word. So we got to graduate from milk to the meat. All these take the blessings of the fivefold. And all these take the blessings of pastors, follow-up leaders, intercessors, people who function as spiritual fathers and mothers over those who are younger spiritually, to bless them, to pray for them, to take care of them spiritually and nurture them until they grow. So don't ever say, because you're really blessed in Christ, you don't need other people to help you and bless you. That is the most ridiculous thing that cannot be proven from the New Testament. I've proven that as long as they're spiritual babies, children, young men, and, and, and fathers, and fivefold ministries, and, and people who God give callings to, there is a line of blessing that can flow. An example also is Romans 16, verse 20. Compare that with Hebrews 2.14 and 2.14. The Bible tells us that the devil is destroyed and that the devil is more or less under our feet. Then why does Romans 16.20 Paul says that shortly the God of peace will shortly put Satan under your feet? Say, hey, wait, I thought Satan already under your feet. Why does he put it in future tense for the Roman? Because Everything that Jesus has done, every blessing that is paid by his precious blood, everything that comes through our faith, our growth to receive it, and to continue uh, teaching where we know what belongs to us in the word. So those who are senior teach us the word so we know and understand it. And the more we understand, the mind is renewed, and then the the unbelief is gone and removed. And the more we are taught the strong meat of the word, then the more we can experience all that Jesus has done for us. So here, uh, the people believe in the power of blessing or cursing. And they wanted Balaam to curse Israel. And so here, uh, ba Balak sent to Balaam, and uh, he lives at Petor, and, and this is what he says in verse 6. We are in Numbers 22, verse 6. Therefore, please come at once, curse these people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, he whom you curse is cursed. Remember last Friday, I talked about the power of a prophet to bless and, and to curse and be careful not to say the wrong words because it's like a curse. You know, when Jesus said to the fig tree in Mark 11, no one shall eat fruit forever. See, you don't even have to use the word curse, but just saying something negative. Uh, uh, the tree died. 
and uh, when uh, Elisha uh, sort of cursed uh, the people who uh, hooligans who were uh, sort of uh, maligning him with words, calling him a bald man, they all died straight away. And on the positive side, um, uh, just to uh, let you know part of my history, uh, when I was very young spiritually, uh, and even though I was in a Baptist seminary, and God gave me a vision of my spirit man, so skinny, and, and then I said, Lord, I'm desperate. I, I, I need to grow. And so the Lord taught me about meditation. And then I saw that I really grew in a lot. And then subsequently, I learned the power of blessing. So you know what I did? Every opportunity I had, I asked the man of God to bless me. I believe something changed when that took place, uh, besides my own meditation. And so uh, I remember uh, uh, when I visited John Osteen, who was the father of uh, Joel Osteen in Lakewood Church, and I stayed there for several weeks, uh, got to know the mission director, and, and then uh, I had an opportunity to meet John Osteen in his office uh, in Lakewood Church in Houston. And when I went there, uh, after talking to him, and he was so kind. He, he is one of the kindest. I visited Buddy Harrison Church. I visited um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Ken Higgins Ministry, and every place I visited. And um, uh, so when I was there, the first thing I asked him at the end, I say, uh, was he's, he's a very kind man who was very, very, uh, especially he, 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 he cares for those in, in third world countries who are slowly coming up. And so one of the things that I ask is, would you bless and pray for me? And I knelt down in his office and he lay hands on me. Now you remember Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that's in his life to the impartation of his hands. See, I believe in the power of blessing. And so when he prayed for me, I felt something came on me. And later on, when I came back to KL, where, where I had a church called the Word Center, something changed in my preaching. You see, usually when I preach, uh, most of the time it's very serious. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, very what, thunderous. And it's like, uh, uh, if you ever or move like the judgment of God is coming on you. I remember that's, that's the, the atmosphere that produced. But after he lay on me, a pastoral anointing came upon me. And um, then when I preached without actually trying to be funny, uh, without trying to be uh, jovial, uh, I end up being way jovial in my preaching. And, and, and sometimes people laugh. Now, occasionally, there's a serious message where I hardly smile when I preach. But my, my, my default mode is that, that I'm usually conversational and very light uh, and jovial in presenting the truth. And something changed. And uh, then um, uh, I wrote to Higgin and ask for prayer too. And then they pray, they send me a letter and says, we pray for you. Because I say, I believe in impartation. And then to Charles and Francis Hunter, to a few ministries and all that. And I believe part of that helped to accelerate my growth. So don't underestimate. At the same time, remember, you know how sometimes Christians are so extreme when they learn one truth, and they, they, they begin to practice only one truth instead of being balanced. And so don't keep coming to me. They bless me, bless me every Sunday, bless. No, no. You just need one blessing. Prepare yourself and be blessed. And of course, this coming uh, February the 9th, please prepare yourself for a blessing for this year. And every year, what I do on February the 9th is I pray for the blessing for all the people in this year. In the Old Testament, they have a practice where every year during the, the, 
uh, day of atonement, the high priest would go in, sacrifice the sacrifice for himself and the people. So there are two sacrifices, one for his own sin and one for the people, because all these are now in Christ. And it's a practice for them to come out of it. Then he will bless the people for another year. And um, it's a good practice. I mean, no harm done. Uh, some people are against everything, you know. Oh, this like Old Testament, this Old Testament, this Old Testament, oh, building altar, Old Testament, uh, music instrument, Old Testament. And some people so extreme, their New Testament church got no music instrument. Why? Because you can't find it. Any music instruments there in the New Testament. Uh, and then uh, every good thing, you know, uh, laying on hands, which is in New Testament, also they are against. I don't know, you know. Um, in the end, in the absence of tradition and methods, you would have to develop some methods anyway. You know, anointing all, at least in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, so there's a methodology that is good. So something that is good, uh, well, what's wrong with that? Uh, if you don't practice uh, yearly blessing, then what do you practice? Uh, no blessing every year? Or uh, no need blessing every year? You know, no, I'm done. Uh, one a uh, blessing once a lifetime. Well, uh, to each one they can walk uh, the way they want. But uh, when I was growing uh, and, and I, I, I so many things that I yet to fully understand and uh, I did not have access to to heaven and all those things. Yeah, I, I had to uh, find those who are elder than me in the spirit to 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 learn from them. And so where we stand today, we have learned and mastered every uh, people who were senior before us, uh, before we can move on. And we thank God for all their blessings through their teaching, through their personal prayers, uh, and some who were uh, who who, who, who gone to be with a lot before we even came to ministry. We thank God for the teaching that has blessed us, that has brought us this far. So here, Balaam was asked to curse. And um, then uh, this was the answer that he gave to them. He says, um, uh, uh, in verse 7, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed for with the diviner's fee in their hand. That means they got money. They brought some money. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And so Balak himself did not come, but he sent the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian. Uh, they brought a lot of money. And uh, then, they, then Balaam said, his answer, he was said, Lord, here tonight, I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So they stay. And then that night, in verse 9, then God came to Bala and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, Now remember, this is his perfect will. God said, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people. For they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the prince of Balak, go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princess of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, but Balaam refused to come with us. Now remember, this is God's perfect will. You shall not go. You shall not curse. God revealed his perfect will to Balaam. 
don't don't get involved with these people and uh, <clears throat> when they give the answer to king bala verse 15 king bala was not going to take no for an answer then bala again sent princess more numerous more honorable than they let me pause there for a moment. See, this is the way the world tries to influence people. By getting prominent men, men of reputation, men who are rich, men who are powerful, to try to influence opinion and push people to do sometimes things that are not God's will. And only those who are worldly ministers, worldly fivefold, worldly pastors, worldly church leaders will bow down to such people. Now, we give respect to everyone for whatever success they have in their life and in, in this world. They must have worked hard. They must have used skills, talents, we respect them and give them the respect. But they should in no way determine what is God's perfect will and what is not God's perfect will, especially if they do not know how to hear from God, especially if they are not deep in the Bible knowledge and, and they always break Bible principles and methodology. That is why in any church, and I find in many churches today, that when a big-time business person who have a lot of money come into the church, straight away, while well, the person could be a baby Christian, yes, he might have a lot of knowledge in the experience to do things. But if it was the Bible church, it would take some time before he's allowed to be in leadership role. But in many churches, they straight away put a person in charge of something in which they are just baby Christians. They're going to make mistakes. Plus, they're going to allow their worldly method to do a spiritual ministry. It's a contradiction in every way. Even the Bible tells us in First John, uh, in John's episode, he says, don't just treat people well because they are rich. And then when there are people who are poor, you, you don't treat them well. The Pharisees were like that. When people who are politically powerful or, or prosperity are laden, uh, they treat them well. And the poor, they don't treat them well. Uh, this is an atrocity in the sight of God. Sometimes poor people, look at many churches, how many really poor people can rise to leadership? I thank God that, that when we were in uh, Tabernacle of Glory in uh, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur last time, where I have at least 40 pastors and leaders under me, some of the most efficient was uh, two deacons who were very, very good and faithful. And uh, one of them was just below average, in, below middle class. Another actually lived in a squatter area. And he made his living by repairing air conditions. And let me tell you, he was one of the best deacons I ever had. And I used to visit all my leaders and have some time with their family. I take turns. And uh, I would visit one of my elders. He, he knows a lot. He, he, he's among the upper class. He knows a lot of people in the government. He used to work with uh, the transport department and everything. A big, huge bungalow house. And he's a good man. Also a humble man. And so riches should not also prevent you from serving God if you are balanced. So I'm not against people who are rich. 
And then I will also take time to visit this deacon of mine. And I will go to his squatter house. I will go to the squatter area and I will sit with them and I will eat with them whatever they cook and I will drink with them and put it this way, I am so glad that he's one of my key leaders and his poverty was no hindrance to his spiritual ability to do it or to, to be part of a, a, a spiritual office. And um, so re remember this, and I'm reminding each one of you because we are going to be the church on the planet Earth, especially after the tsunami. And we're going to be very powerful and prosperous and I pray that none of you will be changed because of power and prosperity. Never ever be proud. Always remain humble. Because that is how the world play their game. Must look into people's heart and not just what a person wear, what a person where a person live, or how what a person drive, or how much is in the bank, or how famous a person is, or how powerful a person is in the world. You must truly look at the spiritual qualifications of a person. And I'll say there are a lot of proud, powerful people out there who, when they come to church, they demand the same record because they're so used to everywhere uh, rolling the red carpet. And no, when we stand in the blood of Jesus, whether you're poor or rich, we worship God sitting on the same position, standing on the blood of Jesus. And we should not be ashamed. And to me, the richest man must learn to sit with a person who has a poor atop house as a... Uh, as a uh, 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 in his normal life, or a person who is homeless. We should not be ashamed to sit and mix with the same company. And also another thing, when you help someone who is in need or poor, don't take away their dignity. Give them the same respect as you would any other person. Because different people suffer different circumstances, because of what they go through, or perhaps of their, uh, their environment they came from, uh, and, and, uh, or they don't have the opportunity for education or training or skill. You know, everyone have their, have their uh, situation. My own mother was illiterate. She didn't know how to read and write. And uh, my father, of course, he, he, he was okay. He, 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 and he has a, a simple government job as a chief, as a clerk, later became the chief clerk in the police headquarters. And, uh, but my mother was illiterate. She could not read and write. But she was, to me, a very, very smart, clever woman. She just never had the opportunity to be school or educated. And I remember, because I loved the library, I would use the photo library books. And I would read the book, and she would be so curious about science, about astronomy, about different things. I would talk a lot to her, describing all these things. And she would spend hours just listening. Later on, when she was born again, I purposely... Uh, uh, ask uh, 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 Chinese church people to teach her Chinese how to read and write and uh, so that she can be follow up and so later on she became friends with them and later she learned to read Chinese and the years before she went home uh, decades before she went home she could read newspaper she could read things she could get knowledge by herself so I'm glad that I did it you know, for her and got her some literacy so she could enjoy getting knowledge on her own. So don't look down on people. 
Sometimes their circumstances, what they went through, uh, you never know. And uh, I believe that if a rich man is not willing to sit with a homeless man on the same pew, something is wrong. Something is wrong. So uh, remember, when we go to heaven, I remember when we, I went to spiritual world, I saw a person who had been a king. And then he go to, he go to the spiritual world, he think everyone treat him like a king. But he end up in hell. But even in hell, he, he like, you know, want to boast like he's a king in God. And people treat him like a king in hell, like a joke uh, uh, kind of thing, and like a mockery. So when everyone die and this life is over, all we are wretched on the other side. Who you are in the world doesn't matter. It's who you are in Christ that matters. So don't ever forget that. And in this move especially, when we're going to have a lot of grace and favor, that we have power in many, many dimensions. So when God revealed the perfect will, Balak, he has this strategy. He sent people more numerous, more honorable than the first group. And this time got more money. And in verse 16, they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippo, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. And please come, because these people, so don't seek honor from people like Balak, which Balaam did. And then this is Balaam's answer. It was 18. Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Remember, the Lord already spoke the first time, which was his perfect will. So again, the next night, verse 20, God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princess of Moab. Then was 22. God's anger was aroused against Balaam. Because in this second time, it was God's permissive will. And here's the strange thing. Didn't God say, to go. Now remember, when the Bible records this story, sometimes it's a summary. What happened is Balaam was eager to go. So the whole night he was keep on saying he wants to go. He said, God, let him go, God, let him go, God, he wants to go. Because so much money and his eyes turned dollar signs. And then God said, Okay, you want to go, go. But you can only say what I ask you to say. He has now moved into the permissive will without realizing. And many, many, many Christians sleep 1%, 2%, 3%. When it's small percentage, you don't realize it. And they are already inside the permissive. But, 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 God was still speaking. Oh, yeah. Even though God is still speaking, it is God was trying to help you negotiate through the permissive will so that you don't fall. But the more you go into the permissive will, the more dangerous it is. And you cross the 50% zone. At first, it's 50-50. You go 60% in the permissive will. You're already getting danger. And then when you cross to a certain level, you have cut too close. You're cutting it 
too close. You're in the danger zone. See, yeah, but God is still speaking. Yes. But it is now speaking to you, trying to help you while you are in the permissive view. See, this explains why God was angry. And here's the other thing. In verse 22, then God's anger was aroused because he went. He was not happy. And the angel of the Lord stood his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Not angels begin to work against you. And he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Remember, he was following the other group, uh, honorable and rich uh, princes of uh, Midian and Moab. Now, the angel was there ready to kill him. But of course, God knows that the donkey was going to save him. And God was going to allow the donkey to save him. God was just trying to warn Balaam. He still has a chance to save his life, to stop going the wrong direction. And so let me read, finish this story, which you're all familiar with. In verse 23, now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam stuck the donkey to turn her back on into the road. So the first time, there is Balaam, he go, uh, how does the donkey move? I'm going to go, that's more like a horse. So the donkey, click, clock, click, clock, click, clock. And there was an angel standing with a sword all ready to slay Balaam. But the prophet was too many dollar signs in his eyes. He can't see the donkey, see the angel, but the donkey has his spiritual eyes open. And the donkey saw this angel blocking the way. So the donkey go, click, clock, click, clock. Saw this thing, and the donkey turned to the field. <laughs> and Balaam was so mad. Say, you stupid donkey, why do you go this way? And started hitting the donkey until the donkey is to get back again. And verse 24, this time the angel stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. You know, some paths are very narrow. I remember on February uh, 2020, when we went to Pergamos and the hotel, which uh, 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 was there, many, because there were more than us can stay at a different hotel. And um, I remember that the bus has to park near the old Pergamon church. And uh, we had to drag our bags all up because the road was too narrow for the bus to go through. And... Um, so we have to unload far away and drag the bags. So here is between two walls. And um, then uh, the angel of the Lord in, uh, in verse 24, the angel of stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side, wall on that side. And again, the, the man of God, the, the prophet didn't see it. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. She pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And this time, second time, as the donkey go, this time there's a narrow path. No field to run out. And uh, the first one got open field. He just ran the open field, run from the angel. And uh, so this is the wall here. And the, and, uh, the donkey go click, clock, click, clock, click, clock. And as he came, the angel stood right in the middle with a drawn sword. So the donkey looked at it. The man of God couldn't see. And, you know, it looks like open path. And the donkey saw it and he squeezed to the side. And then he got... And you could see Balaam, because he's right in the donkey. When you ride the donkey, you have two legs on both sides. So as the donkey goes to one side suddenly, 
and all the way against the wall, he don't keep squeeze that much. So one of his legs will be squashed to the wall and he's dragging the squash leg and the angel's quite big size. So he will squash his leg. And you can imagine Balaam crying out. Ah! And he's scratched and bruised. Maybe the, the clothing all torn out and the blood oozing out. And until he's past the angel and then and then he said, why are you, why donkey you do that to me? And he whipped the donkey again, second time. And uh, then as the donkey continued, click, clock, click, clock, the angel parked himself on another place. In verse 26, the angel of the Lord went further, stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn right or left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, so Balaam's anger was aroused. So the third time, the angel this time stand in a very narrow place and there's no way to go left or right. So the, the donkey go, click, clock, click, clock. And the angel refused to, uh, the donkey refused to move. Boom, and just sat down. This is Balaam. That time was so angry, keep beating the poor donkey, the poor donkey who saved his life three times, got beaten, got uh, abused. Can you imagine doing good to your master and your master keep beating you? That is why God pity the donkey and opened his mouth. As the donkey was being beaten, in verse 28, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. And she said to Balaam, what have I done to you? You struck me these three times. Oh, donkey, talk back to you. And uh, then Balaam said to the donkey, you know, I wonder why Balaam was talking to the donkey. Wasn't he surprised the donkey can talk? And uh, so Balaam said to the donkey, because you abused me, I wish that there was a sword in my hand, for I would not kill you. Oh, not only he want to beat the donkey, he want to kill the donkey. That saved his life. And then the donkey said, uh, uh, let me charge my laptop here. Uh, and then the donkey said, am I not your donkey whom you have ridden all these years? So the donkey is so clever. You know, he, the, the donkey is about to be killed. And then the donkey said, Master, have, have I not served you all these years? Have I ever done this to you? And uh, so the exact words recorded here are, you know, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to you like that? And Balaam says, no. But I, I love the King James Version. Because when, uh, when, when the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and then the donkey was talking and the donkey said, have I ever done this to you? And then the King James uh, Balaam said, nay. So end up in a way you can laugh with King James because the donkey was speaking in human language and uh, Balaam was speaking in donkey language. Nay, nay. And anyway, it's no. And then suddenly, Balaam has opened his saw, the angel. And he realized his faithful, humble donkey had protected his life. That is how you know this is definitely not God's perfect. Will. And in the end, when, he, when, when God opened Balaam's eyes and uh, Balaam bowed down to the angel, and the angel said, The angel protected the donkey. Hallelujah. Thank God. Good angel. Thank you. And uh, the angel said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I've come up to stand against you 
because your way is perverse before me. You know, even though his mouth said that he would just go and see, and he promised a lot, he would only say what the Lord gave him to say, his heart was already changed. His eyes are dollar signs, and his heart is a greedy heart. Later on, when he became uh, the rest of the story, you can read, in the end, he went along and the end, uh, I, I, he said, yeah, he, he would do what the Lord said. And um, Balak was by that time coming and they could not see the angel at all. And uh, he brought him to a high place to look down and curse. And instead of cursing, Balaam, and up, he couldn't control it. Only the good words came out. And the story ended there, but what it didn't record, the Bible don't record all details, is that Balaam was so greedy, he still wanted the money. He still wanted the money. And he tried to think of a way how to get the money still. So he thought, Balak and the Midianites and the Moabites. Since he cannot curse them, he knows how to make them become cursed by making them break God's law. So later on in the book of Numbers, you read about how he taught them to use their women to go and seduce or entice the Israelite men so that they sin against God. And when they sin against God, God's judgment and curse will come on them. All for money. Oh, the one thing you learn about Balaam, and Balaam is one of the bad people mentioned, became a personification of greed. His name is not synonymous with Ministry for profit, his greed, anointing for profit. And he wanted to profit from something that God gave free. So in the book of Jude and elsewhere in the Bible, Revelations mentioned, whenever his name are mentioned, it means that he's someone who use a good office and call anointing for God for evil, to profit for himself. The money is his God, not the true God, but money was his God. That's why he walked in the permissive will. So here is God's perfect will for Balaam. Don't go. And when he keep going nearer and nearer and nearer and nearer until he thought evil, he got too close until he became bad. He completely went outside God's will. And he is an example of evil and greed for the rest of eternity. He fell off. Outside God. God. God will not bless him anymore. He cut too close. Now, there are other examples of that. Eve, when, when Adam, since Adam was created first and he was given a command about the tree of knowledge of good evil, Adam had to communicate it to Eve. But somehow, after Eve know about the forbidden tree and not to eat of that, that fruit, she did something she should not. She was hanging around the tree. The Bible tells us when she saw the tree, it drew her in. That is cutting it too close. Do not 
purposefully go and hang around something that God says, don't do. So when you cut too close, God knows danger zone. The red flags are coming up and say, you think you're strong, but you're not that strong. Don't go too close to something that God forbids. It's called cutting it too close. So in the end, she fell. Something of the tree. Why was she looking at the tree? Why? Don't forget, this is the Garden of Eden. There are millions of other trees. And there's another good tree, tree of life. Plus, there are many other beautiful trees. Why of all the trees is she hanging around that one tree? That's called going too close. Then there's this other person called Cain. And at first, he was okay. But then, when uh, he, he, he wanted to bring out an offering, but then he was not happy with his offering not being accepted. Instead of being humble and learning uh, how to get his accepted, he ended up uh, with anger against his brother. And this is what God told him in chapter 4, verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? <coughs> why has your countenance fallen? Then God made this statement. If you do well, will you not be accepted? So why don't you go and find out why you didn't do well? God said, if you do well, you will be accepted. Instead of learning how to do well, you're going to blame your brother. Because your brother did well, you think by but uh, you think that you, know, uh, you get angry at him. Why don't you learn from him? Why don't you learn how to do well? If you do well, we, see, if God was going to accept him, even though God reject his offering because he didn't do very well, he could have learned to do better. He can say, God, teach me. Teach me. I know I didn't do too well. Teach me. And if you do, if you don't do well, God warn him. Sin lies at the door, and his desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So God was giving Cain a chance. God was telling Cain, Cain, you're cutting it too close. Sin is right next to you. You should walk further away from it. But why should you walk here? You know, our modern times is a very interesting time. Nowadays, you have people taking selfie and photograph and they die. Because... They want to get the best, the nice one. Then they go nearer and nearer the edge, nearer the edge. Yes, more, 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 more. Go nearer, nearer, better view, big screen. I'm all the way screen. Go nearer, boom, the person falls down and die. Actually, one just happened a few days ago in Australia. Uh, Bondi Beach on a cliff, and somebody you know, uh, fell down while taking photo. And, um, uh, you know, uh, of course, we feel sad for the person. It's not something that we mock or anything. But we say, we say it's a warning to everyone. When you take selfie, you take photograph, don't go near the edge. Just for a beautiful photo, it might be your last one. And the, the internet and news is full of stories of, of today. You know, not like, not like 100 years ago, but nowadays, you know, 100 years ago, they look at our time will be very funny. You know why? They will say, we never have people die because they want to take a photo. But nowadays, people are dying for, because they want a selfie, they want a photograph, and they put themselves in a dangerous place. And a lot of them died. I think there was one in China who fell from tall building. Many, many stories of people who die taking selfies or photographs. They got too close. Too near the danger zone. Why? Why want to go near the danger zone? 
The same way, you know, some people, they like to hang around people. Didn't the book of Psalms one tell you don't hang around sinners? Uh, or you can witness to them, but don't hang around sinners just for fellowship and spending the free time or scorners. Uh, so some Christian think they're so clever. Oh, everyone is strong, you know? And then they end up, you know, being poor. First, they will start messing with your thinking. Then you start to talk like them. And then it will enter your heart. Sooner or later, you become a neg negative person. Then you begin to criticize things that you think are imperfect in various things. Uh, you begin to see imperfection in others when you didn't look at the mirror yourself. And then after a while, you get a critical attitude to every, every person. And then after that, you become a negative person. Then you become a fearful person. Then later on, you open the door for sickness, disease, open the door for poverty. Then after that, you're too near already, already too near. Then sooner or later, one fine day, some, some unbelief or some philosophy that is from the devil sounds uh, too appealing to you. You go in and bang, you lose everything, including your salvation, if not all your rewards and position. So don't cut too close. In the end, Cain ended up murdering his brother. He should have dealt with his own anger. He should have dealt with the situation of why he didn't do well and improve upon it, cutting it too close. Remember, when God gives his advice, don't think you're smarter than God. When God says, I advise you, don't go there. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's okay, Lord. See, I'm still with you. See, you can see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom, you fall over. Don't cut too close. Why you want to cut too close? Jesus never did that. Jesus never cut it too close. Jesus cut it clean. He wouldn't go where God doesn't want to go. And then there's another guy, Solomon. And God in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 17. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, God said, one day you will have a king. And this is what the king must not do. Look at 17 verse 16, Deuteronomy. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And then the Lord said, after saying what thou shalt not do, he says in verse 80, what thou shalt do. And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So he's supposed to do all these things. Guess what? Solomon never did all these things. Which David always read the Bible. The whole Psalms 119, the longest Psalm, it's all about the word and the Bible. He loved the Bible. But Solomon doesn't show any love for the Bible. And everything God said not to do, he did. He cut too close. And you see, verse 16, he shall not multiply horses for himself. In 1 Kings 4.26, it says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses. Why? Uh, 
and not enough. He has 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariot, 12,000 horsemen. And these governors, each man in his mom, provided food for King Solomon and all those things. And uh, they also brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and steam. He will whole organization system for his 40,000 horses. And uh, so far, God never cut him off. But he was cutting it too close. And um, then you also have uh, uh, 1 Kings 10, 26 to 29. Uh, and Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, you know, 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horses, which he stationed in the chariot cities. And then look at verse 28. Remember God said, don't go to Egypt. Verse 28. Also Solomon had horses imported from Egypt. There you go. And um, then in chapter 11, verse 1, King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. He's going back to Egypt. He wanted to marry an Egyptian princess. God said, don't go there. And the women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites say, all oh, this he did. You know, in the end, Solomon had uh, 1,000 wives and concubines. That's too many. And in the end, it is true. What God says is true. His heart turned away. And he says, nor shall he multiply silver and gold for himself. But it says here in Solomon's time, in 1 Kings 10, 14, the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talent. How does the number 666 tell you already? Of gold. Besides that, from the traveling merchants, etc. And then he talked about how in Solomon's time, uh, he got so much gold that in verse 21, uh, not one was silver, for this was accounted as nothing. Silver became no value because it got so much gold. Everything God said, don't do, he go near, 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 near. You know, at first you get 10 horses, 100 horses, 1,000 horses, 10,000 horses, 40,000 horses. And at first, you know, he has uh, uh, one wife, you know, then a few wives, then uh, 10 wives. Then 100 wide, then 1,000. Oh boy, this guy got too close. And then at first he has uh, uh, some gold. Then he has more than enough gold. Then he has a whole room of gold. Then rooms full of gold. Then he has storehouses of gold. Uh, too much, too much. Cutting it too close. The permissive will doesn't mean that God has stopped speaking. The permissive means that. You choose that road, God is doing his best to help you. That's why he's still going to talk to you. Remember, there's another story. When Israel, Israel won a king, and it was too fast, and they won a king for the wrong motive, they told, they told Samuel, we want to be like the other nations. Our nation so strange, so queer, so unusual. We are theocracy, they are monarchy. We want a monarchy. Well, you want to be like other nations. Your motive is wrong and it's too fast. You didn't pray, didn't spend time, and God takes time to raise the person. Because at that time, when they asked, David was not born yet. And in the end, God was not happy. But you notice what happened? God still helped them choose a king. King Saul. Samuel took the trouble to get a king for them, appointed the king, inaugurated the king, and then passed them all the kingship. God did it. God spoke. God talked to them. But it was all in permissive will. Understand this fact. When it's not God's perfect will, it's not God's perfect will. Don't cut too close.
to the chase. Now, at this time, I like uh, the chart that I sent to Colin to, uh, to show. Uh, Colin, I did send you a chart uh, this morning. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, it's a summary of this that I have taught. And later on, you know, uh, uh, you can send a chart to each uh, you. For those of you who are not in WhatsApp, you can write to call in and request for the chart. Or when it's uploaded, the sermon, you can download it with the chart. Uh, it's called uh, Permissive Real and Perfect Real. And, uh, you give me a minute, I'll do it. Uh, thank you. Sorry yeah, that I didn't get it to you yesterday. And um, so while Colin is, is uh, looking into that, um, I'm going to talk about how it's important to live God's perfect will. Who are those who have lived God's perfect will? See, we need some examples, right? And uh, Jesus, of course, he lived God's perfect will. And some of the people who live God's perfect will did not have a good start and they might be imperfect, but more or less, they live God's perfect will. I would say Jesus, 100%, of course. Moses, Moses, as much as he could, he lived God's perfect will. Even though there was an imperfect situation where he, he accidentally killed uh, an Egyptian, uh, in his situation, he still found the place to go. So I believe God was still guiding him, even though that thing happened. Now, here's the chart, and uh, it should be big enough for you to see. See, under permissive will, which you can see for cutting it too close, 1% to 99%, you're inside the boundary area. You know, God divided his angels into three groups during the fall of uh, Satan. He divided it into the pristine zone where everything is the perfect real God. And then the boundary zone, the angels that watch the boundary zone. And then there's a zone that is the darkness where Satan has taken over certain planets and places. And uh, so this, you will always find these three areas. Now, something is going to happen to our planet. All the fallen angels are being pushed back from the universe to this planet. And at some point, by His grace, God is going to help us identify areas which we will call the pristine zone. And then there will be boundary zones. And then there will be some areas so dark that they're given over to evil. And this is all temporarily before Jesus comes and, and gets rid of all the enemies. So whereas in the darkness, you have fully in the darkness, 100% total failure, inside area of darkness, complete domination by demons, complete judgment and hell. An example of that, if eating fruit giving to Adam, Cain murdering his brother Abel, Balaam teaching how to make Israel sin, Solomon worshipping idols. So Solomon cut too close, he fell. The day he worshipped idol. He crossed the line. Solomon was finished. Completely finished. And um, although in the end he saved and he wrote Ecclesiastes, he turned back. But more or less, even though he was rewarded greatly on the earth, Solomon missed a lot of rewards in heaven. And you don't find that God used Solomon in many ways even you know, in a spiritual dimension, because he realized also he's missed the opportunity. He, he cut too close. And those in the permissive will, you can see in the middle area, varying protection of angels for 99% to 1%. So if you're in permissive will 1%, you still got 99% protection. But the more you go in, the more you go in, at some point, angels will try to prevent you from going any further. But if you insist, uh, uh, angels, you know, they try to stop you, but free will is still recognized. And I put number five under permissive will, some reward to zero reward. So some people got zero reward 
although they, they are still safe. And um, why compromise that? So like if hanging around the tree, uh, Cain at the door of sin, Balaam still greedy to go, Solomon having too much riches, wives and horses. And then under perfect will, very safe distance. Keep a distance. Keep a distance. Which is why, do you realize that in the Bible they tell you, uh, no, don't walk with those who got antichrist spirit. And, you know, people give all kinds of excuse and reason. Ah, I'm trying to win them over. Did God really send you to win them over? Wouldn't the person God sent them to win, win over a person very strong in the world and able to, to point to all the errors and not just hanging around for the sake of emotional, pally pally fellowship? And uh, so keep a safe distance. Psalms 1 tells you to keep a safe distance so that you can prosper. And when you're in a perfect will and you keep a safe distance, this is what God wants. Zero chance of failure. Yes, there is such a thing as zero chance of failure because you keep a very strong distance. You don't even go near things that you know you're not interested in. Well, there's no chance. Well, let's say you spend all your time with uh, with godly people and uh, you hardly have much time. In fact, if you go through all my messages and when we are very active, you know now we are online and we. And we are building back to the activity. When we are very active uh, in an active church, you probably have your home fellowship, you have your Bible study, you have your all-night prayer, you have a Sunday, probably three, four services. And some people, they're so hungry, they attend all the services. And then you count how many days you have left. I mean, you're like really sure that there's not much chance for you to go anywhere uh, to do wrong. And so there's a very safe distance, zero chance of failure in the light and far away from the boundary zone. And a full protection of angels, full reward of earth and heaven. An example, life of Jesus, life of Enoch, life of Elijah. Elijah actually, even though he has some, uh, the Bible says he's the same nature like us in James and he experienced some level of loneliness. But Elijah... You know, he lived the, the life of one same life of Daniel, life of Paul, also life of Moses. Uh, so they all have the different things, but in the end, they live the life that God wants them to live. So follow these examples and live the perfect will of God. Again, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been through. It only matters the journey ahead of you. And we go about 40 odd years to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So get ready for that and do God's perfect will and, and understand that there are so many end-time prophecies. I've covered the whole series. Now this is a conclusion. All the prophecies point to the great benefit of being born in this generation, in this time that we live. There's never a time like ours where you could, you could never die, but you will enter into the rapture and you will enter to become the bride of Christ. And all the Christians in 2000 years before us have prepared us for this day. We, have the fin we are the final song. We are the finale of the finales. We are the last second and minutes of the last days. We are privileged. We thank God for all who came before us. But we are going to end it beautifully and well. Just like we're going to end this 40-day uh, fast uh, well, we're going to end our life well by always living in the perfect will of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray you establish your people in your perfect will. Help them to understand what a privilege it is to be part of this end time. And no matter what they face, no matter whether they are on the mountain or in a valley, in a rough sea or in a calm sea, that they would know that Jesus is in the boat with them. They did not fear for any storm. They did not fear for any danger. 
Because as long as Jesus is with us, we shall overcome. We are the overcomers. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.